Uh, I'm going to sp uh, speed read through my, uh, my presentation so we have plenty of time for uh, some Q's and A's and some discussion. Um, I wanted to first start with the election in, in Brazil uh, last Sunday election, which um, uh, resulted in the, uh, the re-election of the incumbent uh, for four more years. Uh, her name is Dilma Rousseff. Now, the hoary cliché, and I'm not a big fan of hoary clichés, but this one just happens to always come back to haunt Brazil. Um, and that is that uh, Brazil is the country of the future and will always be. Um, <laughs> and what that means is, is that um, for one reason or another, uh, the country always seems to uh, come, come short of reaching its potential. Uh, Brazil is a uh, remarkable country, a continent the size of a whole continent, uh, 200 million people, excellent human capital. It has a, uh, a world-class agricultural system, uh, a manufacturing uh, sector, produces Embraer airplanes, um, a stable democracy, stable polity, and yet for some reason it can never break through into uh, a first class uh, uh, world status. And frankly, I would categorize this election once again as a mis missed opportunity to take the next step uh, forward. Um, Ms. Rousseff is a protege of the past president, President Lula, uh, of the left-wing Workers' Party. Now, um, Lula uh, is credited with pretty much leaving the, the private sector alone and allowing it uh, uh, to, to have a, a freedom of movement. And, and, that, um, and, and to his credit, uh, he, he avoided some of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the most inane ideas of the uh, Chavez mold and uh, succeeded in not destroying the Brazilian economy. Now, to the election. In... Um, in its uh, way of, of really getting succinctly the, uh, to the core of the issue, The Economist put it this way, talking about Ms. Rousseff's reelection by three percentage points over her challenger, Aesio uh, Neves of the center-right uh, Socialist Party. Go figure that. But um, in any case, as The Economist puts it, her performance during her first term did not justify her victory. Um, Brazil today is racked by recession, inflation, opaque uh, public accounts, rising public debt, and a looming downgrade in the country's credit rating. That raises two questions. One, what happened to Brazil? And number two, how did she win? So question number one, as we all know, three, four, five years ago, six years ago, BRICS was the big fashion the emerging economies, the, uh, Brazil was part of that, uh, Russia, India, and, and China. Well, um, what that was built based on was really the commodities boom and Chinese demand for raw materials and agricultural products. Brazil met the, uh, met the supply and uh, profited enormously. That gave, really, the, the political class in uh, Brazil a reason to uh, be complacent and allowed uh, structure, badly needed structural reforms to the economy, the internal economy, to go unaddressed. And so it really gave a false sense of uh, just ever, ever, ever uh, moving forward economic growth. Well, what happened was as, as China cooled off, uh, circumstances changed dramatically. And now Ms. Rousseff is uh, basically uh, reaping the whirlwind of unmet attention to the, uh, the needed reforms in the economy. How did she win then? Well, she was very effective in making the election a referendum basically on welfare programs. Uh, under, during the good times, uh, a few years ago, President Lula established these wealth transfer programs that uh, uh, Brazil remains a very, very uh, uh, divided society. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's got a growing middle class, but still it's a, uh, a huge division between haves and half-nots. And so uh, wealth transfer programs during, uh, during the, the Lula administration and during her first uh, term uh, became extremely popular among low-income Brazilians. And she turned it into an election about those wealth transfer programs. Um, and, and so uh, Neves was uh, a, a very, very, uh, his platform was very market-friendly, vo very, very uh, pro-private sector, wanted uh, uh, open trade, uh, take Brazil into, the, into, into that next level. But she made it seem like Neves would cut these welfare programs. And she was very effective in making that argument to millions and 51 million uh, Brazilian voters who voted for her. So what happens now? Uh, it's easy to say uh, more of the same. Now, the, the, uh, much of the conventional wisdom in, in Washington in, uh, among the chattering class that, that looks at Latin America, oh, well, Ms. Rousseff is going to have to address the economic. She's going to have to uh, uh, introduce more uh, uh, market-friendly policies. My reaction is, you know, prove it. I, I, you know, why? Um, Brazil remains on, still a uh, teetering edge. Um, some may, re may remember before the uh, World Cup soccer tournament, we had uh, uh, wide, widespread protests in uh, Brazilian cities, and this was mostly the, the rising middle class that uh, was protesting against uh, bad services, poor infrastructure, the kinds of expectations that any middle class would want in any country. So she has a balancing act because she has never manifested any particular uh, uh, adeptness at market-friendly policies. Um, she is a, uh, a leftist through and through. She is a former guerrilla. In fact, her, uh, her terrorist cell uh, during the military dictatorship in Brazil was uh, responsible for the, for the murder of a, uh, of a U.S. serviceman, a U.S. Atta defense attache. Um, and I, I have seen absolutely no indication that she has gotten any religion on, on free market economics. And, um, and so it remains to be seen uh, how her next four years uh, will go. Second issue, uh, Venezuela. Venezuela on the UN Security Council, uh, new member. And I, I thank Frank for circulating a letter a couple of weeks ago, uh, which I was happy to sign, protesting to the, administra the Obama administration. How are you going to let this happen? This, this is a disaster. Um, the weak-kneed countries of Latin America uh, basically uh, uh, genuflected to Venezuela's a bid for this, uh, for the rotating seat, Latin American seat on the Security Council. It gives Venezuela and its uh, raving populist government a platform, obviously, to uh, uh, attack the United States, to undermine the United States policy objectives um, at the UN Security Council. We take, and for all its faults, and its shortcomings. We as a country, we as a government, take the UN Security Council seriously. Therefore, we expect to have serious partners who will think seriously and act seriously on the Security Council. That, by def definition, excludes the Maduro government in Venezuela. Not only uh, is, will it overtly work to undermine U.S. interests, uh, working with Cuba, working with Russia, working with China, uh, working with um, Syria to garner opposition. That's what they do. Uh, Foreign Policy Magazine had a, an article this week talking about how Cuban reps at the UN were uh, going around uh, lobbying other delegations on behalf of not uh, turning North Korea over to the International Criminal Court. That's what these governments do in New York. For all of the bloviating and, and the nonsensical activity that goes on up there, our enemies take it seriously. And the other thing it does, it gives Venezuela, because 
again, the chattering class in this town, oh, let Venezuela have it. They're just going to be making fools of themselves. It won't mean anything. It's largely symbolic. It is not largely symbolic. And, and even if it is symbolic, these countries, these despots know how to use symbolism to garner legitimacy at home especially. And it is a, what it does, it places uh, the opposition, the, the beleaguered opposition in these countries on the defensive. It makes their work so much harder when the government can preen about and bask in the international legitimacy that is given to them by being on, for example, the UN Security Council. So it is not a freebie. It's not a gimme. And it's unfortunate. When this came up during the Bush administration, when, when I was there, we did a, a full court press uh, diplomatic effort, and, and we, we succeeded in blocking Venezuela from getting that seat. Um, uh, I don't know how many years ago that was. But uh, the, the Obama administration, they didn't care. Uh, let, it, let, let it pass. And uh, not caring is basically the, um, the epitaph of this administration in, uh, in Latin America. Finally, let me just, uh, uh, Stephen mentioned the, uh, Russia's role in Latin America. Let, let me tell you what that's all about. Uh, again, everybody, the, the, uh, the poo-pooers say, Oh, you know, let him just do his, uh, let Putin do his uh, photo ops with these leftist leaders in Latin America. It doesn't mean anything. They're not going to do anything. And, well, that's not the way they see it. Um, in, in Latin America, uh, just like in the Cold War, our enemies see it as the soft underbelly. And they are exploiting official Washington's inattention to Latin America to make Key, make very key inroads. We are talking about Russia. We are talking about China. We are talking about Iran. And we are talking about transnational criminal organizations. Now, yes, militarily, Venezuela does not threaten the United States. But what is a threat to the United States, an immediate threat, is transnational crime. And what's happening with this a nefarious collection of leftist populist governments in Latin America, aided and abetted by the Russias, the Chinas, the Irans, is creating enabling environments for transnational criminal organizations, drug traffickers, human smugglers, human traffickers, weapons traffickers. So all of this is happening under the nose of the Americans. Somebody who does get it is the commandant of Southcom, uh, General Kelly. And he has been extremely vocal. And I, I encourage everybody who wants to really know what's going on in Latin America today from a security standpoint is Google John Kelly's name, uh, commander of Southcom, and read his congressional testimonies and his speeches. With that, if anybody has any questions, I will be happy to answer. Oh, so this, is a, this is a moment when, uh, and I, I'm so glad you made the point about General Kelly, because uh, there's a military guy uh, the likes of whom we don't see very often uh, yeah. these days. And he certainly is speaking truth to power on a whole host of issues. Um, to the extent that uh, his warnings are in fact now being, you know, conveyed, do you see any sign that there is any adjustment on the part of the Obama administration in terms of either its dealing in the macro with Latin America or even some of the specific issues like the transnational crime problem that you mentioned? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, unfortunately. <laughs> I was afraid of that. You're spinning, you're spinning. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think, Frank, um, you know, uh, as we all know, uh, it's all about personnel. And um, when an administration places uh, career officials in important positions. Nothing against career officials. Um, Some of our best friends are career <laughs> officials. Right? But it's not a sign that you're looking for any um, forward thinking. It, it's, it's, it's strictly a sign that, that you expect them to manage. Manage. Make sure that the pot doesn't overflow. 
and then you just sit there all day with your hand on the. But um, what that what that allows is problems to fester, and um, I, I I know a lot of people that are are in 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 positions, um, and, and they are career officials uh, that relate to the Western Hemisphere, Latin America, and, um, and and I don't think that they have much support from uh, the higher ups, the senior officials, and so the um, the, the the issue just gets continually pushed to the back burner, and there is no. There, there, there is uh, certainly a reaction to events. Um, now that we had the border crisis this past summer, now um, they're looking at some uh, issues. But uh, you know, to 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 appear to be doing something about them. But as we all know in this room, is that when you don't have senior officials engaged, then you're talking about lowest common denominator initiatives and very uh, methodical plotting. Um, and, and so that's that's where we are as far as the the uh, the Obama administration's uh, uh, approach to Latin America. I will say this though that I think that General Kelly earlier this year when he testified before the Senate um, and, and said some of the things he did about growing uh, threats that he certainly did get the attention of some important uh, uh, senators like Kelly Ayat, who we are trying to follow up with to keep them engaged on the issue. Fred? I have a question that's not directly related to your uh, presentation. Alan Gross, a former USAID em uh, employee, has been in a Cuban prison since 2009. Marine Sergeant Andrew Tamarizi has been in a Mexican prison for almost six months. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, has the Obama administration done about this? I mean, I just find it outrageous that countries in this region are taking U.S. government employees hostage. Yes. What has been done about this, and what can Congress do to get these men out? Well, uh, it's a great question, Fred. Um, and in fact, we were just talking about um, the Marine in, um, in Mexico yesterday at a lunch, and and. Uh, we were talking, I was with obviously uh, uh, people who see the world like I do, and we were, we were absolutely flabbergasted that the, our ambassador in Mexico hasn't just wiped his calendar clean for six months and spent nothing but getting that Marine uh, uh, released from a Mexican jail. Now, what this is all about is, well, you know the story, he, he uh, apparently uh, got confused and he crossed the border. He, um, I guess, Marine Reserves, and, and he's been kept in jail ever since. Mexico throws a fit, a collective fit, whenever one of their nationals, for example, is subjected to capital punishment. And for usually very good reasons. Uh, they're usually uh, uh, convicted of crimes of murder, rape and murder, very violent crimes that warrant capital punishment. But they turn into national cause celebs that the United States is executing one of their nationals. And, um, and the whole uh, 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 system is engaged, you know, all of the uh, 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 against capital punishment, NGOs, and, and so they become national. This is a way for Mexico to uh, get us back. Even though our judicial system acts uh, transparently and, and openly and according to our laws, uh, somehow we're supposed to draw an equivalence between a, a poor Marine that, that took a wrong turn and a convicted murderer in our own judicial system. So that's the kind of equality that, that's going on here. And, and what, what the ambassador, every cooperation program with Mexico should be stopped in its tracks until that man is released. It is a absolute, uh, it's appalling that he has been kept that long in Mexico. On Alan Gross in Cuba, another situation. We have not done nothing. The administration has done nothing to raise the cost to Cuba of holding that, that man who was unjustly jailed for a crime that is considered a crime nowhere else in the world. And that was he was bringing uh, satellite uh, uh, connection
for internets uh, to uh, Cuban citizens without the permission of the government. The, the, the regime in Cuba relies uh, almost entirely for its economic sustenance from uh, flights from the United States to Cuba carrying uh, Cuban Americans back to visit family members in Cuba, bringing cash, bringing uh, all manner of household goods. Those flights should have been suspended uh, immediately until they release Alan Gross. Is there another question? Mario? Don't tell me, Brazil. <laughs> uh, I totally agree with your analysis, absolutely. I just wanted to, uh, to add one thing. Uh, there's enormous polarization, and that's the good news. Uh, people, uh, half of the population is fed up with, uh, with the Workers' Party, and it's, um, it's also geographically, as you know, it's geographically half of the country. The, uh, the North and the Northeast are the ones who, who, who get the welfare and all that, et cetera, and the, the, the poorer uh, regions and the South and, and, and Southeast is, is, is fed up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they, they are fed up from a conservative position, pro-American, et cetera, anti, anti Maduro, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's the good news. And the next four years, we'll, we will see a lot of, of polarization. Polarization is good. It's good here in the United States. The United States gives the example of polarization, and I think Brazilians are imitating. You know, Mario, uh, thank you for those comments. I, I, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think there was a lot of good things that manifested itself in this last election. Uh, the number of Brazilians that were frustrated with corruption, were frustrated with economic stagnation, and they weren't looking for welfare checks. They were looking for opportunity. And, and so um, it is incumbent upon the opposition. I think we'll, we'll, we will see Mr. Neves again uh, in, in national elections, but it's incumbent that, that this movement um, continue in Brazil. And one thing that I didn't mention, I think that in many ways this recent election in Brazil um, says a lot about the current uh, state of affairs in many places in Latin America, and that's this way, is that you may ask, well, you know, okay, why people would opt for a simple welfare check rather than being, uh, you know, why, why just accept the fish uh, when, when uh, you can do much, so much better if, you're, if somebody teaches you to fish. And, What's going on in, in many of these countries, and, and, it, and it's part of the reason why you, we see these, uh, these uh, jokers like Hugo Chavez and uh, Rafael Correa in Ecuador and Evo Morales in Brazil, these populist types, is that what we've seen in Latin America is that in, in many ways the political systems have been opening up faster than the economic systems. And what I mean by that is more and more people are, uh, are, are getting the franchise, they, they, are, they are voting, uh, it, the, the political systems have opened up a lot faster uh, to votes and political participation than the economies have been opening up uh, to give them opportunity. So they are, they're, they're, they're voting for very narrow interests. They're, 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 they're voting to make political statements about the, the lack of opportunity uh, that, that they see economically. So if you give a poor Brazilian a choice, you want a welfare check or you want us to um, uh, uh, promise you more economic opportunity in the next few years, they're going to take the welfare check because they don't see it yet. And, and that's the challenge for a lot of these countries in Latin America is to open up their economies at the same pace that the political systems have opened up. I'm sorry to say it's the challenge here too. Erin? Uh, yes, thank you so much for your, your comments. Um, going back to Mexico, okay, um, as I understand it, Mexico is right now successfully holding secure their southern border because of the surge this summer and it didn't go down well. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, um, they have played a, a critical part in preventing any more of a surge right now. 
Presumably this administration has asked for their assistance in that because it was complicating the campaigns. Okay. All right, so is the matter of keeping uh, Tamarisi in prison to sort of like um, keep that symbolic gesture going with their own citizenry who still maintain a strong gringo mm -hmm. complex and at the same time complying with the pressure from this administration to keep the, uh, the surge from pursuing. And, and can you expand on that, please? Well, I, I do think that, um, that there was a role that Mexico played um, up until the time that it, uh, it blasted into the headlines the, uh, the surge of, of unaccompanied children and families trying to cross. Um, basically, Mexico was waving them through. Um, and what the administration did behind the scenes was, and, and I think that they handled it well because they didn't make a big public splash about it, but it was a little, I think it was a little bit more than asking for their help. I, I think there was a significant n amount of arm twisting and, um, and say, look, you know, cut the crap. Uh, this is a problem, and we need you to help us fix it. And so there was likely a very, very unvarnished uh, uh, communique that went to Mexico City about this issue. Um, I, I don't know that the, the, the sergeant's case uh, would, uh, would factor in to that, that, uh, that dynamic. Um, I do know this, is that I, I do not believe that it's a uh, permanent fix, meaning that Mexico is always going to help us uh, by, by blocking uh, transit of refugees or, or immigrants coming from uh, Central America. And uh, my final word on the, on the border crisis is that um, we never addressed any of the, uh, of the root causes of the crisis. I think we put a Band-Aid on it, and uh, it's, it's likely to happen again. Could I, could I ask a re related question, um, Jose, and then we'll probably have to stop, but um, my understanding is that Mexico's got among the most rigorous immigration laws in the world. Uh, if our standard were the same as Mexico, we would not be having the problems we're having in many respects. Um, they're obviously uh, only allowing people through on the basis that they're transiting. There has to be some sort of explicit understanding mm -hmm. that they're not going to be Absolutely. Know, decamping and, and, and spending time there. Um, so point one, uh, how, how explicit is that uh, arrangement with the government if it's been suspended for the moment? Is it, you know, at any moment uh, something that they can reconstitute? Mm -hmm. But secondly, would you just talk about from your experience with the hemisphere, if indeed the president does what he's promised to do, finally, after the election, and uh, creates an amnesty program of some kind, and according to these reports that they're printing millions of these cards, uh, who knows how many more it will ultimately be. Mm -hmm. But um, how much of a magnet will it be yeah. for intensified immigration in the future? I think it's a, uh, I think any, any immigration uh, a maneuver or, or edict or, or uh, directive that uh, I, I think it's a huge mistake. Um, I think that anything that is done on immigration that doesn't, uh, I mean, this cannot, immigration cannot be Obamacare redo. You need bipartisan support. Um, and, and so, however immigration issue is resolved, um, it, 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 it requires a bipartisan approach. I am against, um, these sorts of unilateral gestures, I think that uh, they are, are, are spun and, and, and uh, communicated, the, they send the wrong signal. I think that largely the summer crisis was as a result of the DACA, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the moratorium on deportations. It, it was twisted by the smuggling gangs to say that if you got across the border, you can stay. And so that was the message. And, and these, drug, these, these smuggling organizations, they're very sophisticated. Um, they would, they'll, they'll run ads in local newspapers uh, down in Central America saying that, you know, you pay us $5,000, we'll, we'll drop your child off on the other side of the Rio Grande. So these unilateral gestures 
um, then get translated. And, and, and it, there's a lot that gets lost in that translation, obviously. So I, I, I'm totally against it. I think that we need, I think our country needs broad immigration reform, but that's not the way to do it. And in terms of the, the question about Guatemala and other oh, I'm sorry. nations yes. having uh, some sort of understanding with Mexico. Yes. Um, right now, I, I don't, I'm not privy, I, I don't know how um, the, uh, I imagine um, there was uh, extremely high level uh, phone calls that were made that, that something had to be done. Mexico knows. They, they know exactly what, what we were uh, calling about, shall we say. Um, and uh, see, they, they, as a protest against, or as a um, symbol about how they feel about Mexican immigrants um, being required to abide by our laws in terms of crossing our border, in other words, they believe that there shouldn't be a border, um, it, because they believe that it's cons it, that it re remains consistent for them to not recognize their border with Central America. And therefore, anybody can come as long as they are passing through, as long as they are passing through. Um, because if they decide to stay, it is, uh, it's in, in many ways hardly an improvement uh, in their own lives in Guatemala or, the, or El Salvador or Honduras. Uh, is harsh, and, and there's, there's, there's bigotry. Um, criminal penalties as well. Criminal penalties, yeah. yes. So um, that, that's what's going on there. And, and we did succeed in uh, convincing them uh, that, um, that this was uh, unacceptable. And again, it's only as long as, um, I guess, we, uh, as soon as Uncle Sam loses attention, it's going to go right back. To or as soon as we have an election, as yes. the case may be. Um, 